Well, uh, Rachel ruined my introduction. I wasn't going to tell anybody Dave wasn't preaching today. And then all I was going to say is Dave has never looked better on this stage. Anyway, uh, I did get a little prep on Friday. Dave sent a text and said, if by some chance flights get delayed or canceled and I can't be there Sunday, could you preach? And I said, sure. You know, and I didn't give it a lot of thought. I have a lot of faith in American Airlines. Okay. <laughs> And I say that because I have flights to India later this year on American Airlines. So, 10.30 last night, the real message came. We're not going to make it. Can you preach? And so I'm glad to because that's what God does. God, you see, never makes it comfortable. Understand that. Never makes it comfortable. Several years ago, when we were living in a little town outside of Shelbyville... And I was at a little church there. My two oldest daughters, who were six and four at the time, had been downstairs in the basement on a Saturday, which is usually my day because I get the kids. Because Kathy needs a break, and she's doing whatever it is she was doing on that Saturday. And I had them lunch ready, and I called them up for lunch, and they sat down, and they said, Dad, we just saw the greatest thing on television, and you've got to get one. I said, oh, really? What was it? She said, it'll cut Frozen meat, it'll cut potatoes, it'll cut beef, it'll slice turkey, it will even cut wood, and then it'll slice a tomato. Really? You ever seen that commercial? And guess what? Guess what? Guess what the cost was? Oh, yes, you got it right. You probably bought one. Look, if you were around in the 90s, early 90s, here it is, Miracle Blade 2. It can do it all. It can slice. It can dice. It can cut. It can do anything. And when you're done doiling, and here's the big thing. It never needs sharpening. I need a witness. Jerry? Okay, Tim. No, I'm going to do a demonstration. Come here. This never needs sharpening. Never. It was bought in 1992. Come on. Trust me. Trust me. Never need sharpening. (laughs) Maybe it's dull. I don't know. But we buy into this stuff, don't we? Have you ever seen those? Have you ever seen those gimmicks, those sales? $19.99. And here's the other kicker on top of that. If you order now, guess what? You'll get a second one. What if it lasts forever and never needs sharpening? Why do you need to? Did you ever think about that? Why do you need two? What do I need two of them for? Why are you giving me a second one? I'll tell you why. Because it does need sharpening. It's wore out. I found it in my toolbox because it does a pretty good job if you're really wanting to edge grass in the yard, okay? It's good at that. I want to ask you something. When you encounter things, how do you respond? The question of the day, how did you encounter Jesus? How did you encounter Jesus? We've heard these other pitches. We've heard stuff about life. We've heard about everything that's going to change your life from diets to this, to this food, to that food, to whatever it is. It's going to be a life-changing experience. But the only one so far that I've ever found that's really, really changed my life was when I encountered Jesus. How did you do it? How did you do it? You remember when people used to do business with a handshake? Do any of you remember that? And when they shook your hand, you didn't need a lawyer. You didn't need a notary. You didn't need an eyewitness. You didn't need a contract. You didn't need anything. I remember the first car loan I got. I was getting ready to go to college. Graduated from, from high school. I'd finished my summer job. I had a job waiting for me because I knew a friend down there that got me on at Burger King. But at the time when I went to the bank, I did not have a job, okay? I wanted to borrow $1,500, this is 1976, to buy a 1972 Chevy Nova. Good choice. I went to one bank, they wouldn't even, they said, you're going to have to co-sign her. My mom wouldn't go into, my dad said, I can't. And that was the end of it. I went to another bank, and the guy's name we knew, we knew our family, 
told him my plight. I said, are you going to need my parents to co-sign? He said, no, why would I need that? I know you. I know your family. I've known you since you were a little boy. The payment's due on this date. It's $59 a month. Here's the check. Sign the papers, and out the door I went. (laughs) Could you do that today? Probably not. My thing that I want to talk about is having faith in something that's real. That's real. There's a story in the Bible that oftentimes stories like this get attention, but they really get kind of overlooked. They get overlooked. It's not one of those big stories of parting the Red Sea and people walking on water. It's not one of those stories where a little boy has loaves and fishes and Jesus heals 5,000 people, although he did all of those things. It's another story. John chapter 4, verse 43 After the two days he left Galilee, now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more, he visited Canaan in Galilee, where he turned water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee... From Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who who was close to death. Unless people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, sir, come down before my child dies. Go, said Jesus, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed, and while he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time that his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left. Then the father realized that this was exactly the time at which Jesus said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. Now, I read that story numerous times without picking up on some unique things. A lot of times, we want to see the spectacular in order to believe something. Here's a man whose son was dying with fever. Now, we know it was dying because that's what the Scripture said. So whatever disease he had, whatever was causing his fever, he was near death. Jesus had been to Galilee before. He had just come through Samaria performing miracles, and people heard all that he had been doing. And this man knew he was in Galilee, and so he went to him. A fever was going to lead to his son's death, and he was desperate. Jesus' response seems a little harsh. The man said, come and heal my son, and he goes, Well, unless people see signs and wonders, they're not even going to believe. But he wasn't talking to this man. He was talking to all the people that were there. He was talking to the people that we referred to, if you go back a page in John chapter 2, when Jesus was in Galilee before healing people. And he said, now many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them. Listen to this. For he knew all the people. He did not need any testimony about mankind. He knew what was in each person. I'll tell you something. Whatever is in your heart today, Jesus knows. He knows. If it's an anger about somebody, if you're upset about this, if there's deceit in your heart, whatever is there, he knows. All the important reason to understand why I need Jesus. Why I need Jesus. This man's faith drove him to Jesus. Jesus seems a little harsh because he wanted the people to know that it wasn't miracles that should bring you to him. Shouldn't be miracles. 
That should be not what brings you here. Remember before when Jesus was in Nazareth, from Nazareth went to Galilee, and the people of his own hometown were ready to push him off the mountain? Galileans had showed up to see miracles. That's the only thing they wanted was the show. Ever seen people like that? Ever been in a situation like that where people want to see the show? While I was in college, I took a class on personal evangelism, this thing, and sharing your faith. And I had to go to make three calls on people. I'd never done a call myself. I didn't know what that was. So I called a friend of mine who knew a minister who said, we can go with me on Saturday. So I went. We went to a couple of places. We went to the hospital. And then we went to a little girl's house. She was 10 years old laying on a couch. I remember it like it was yesterday. We walked in. We sat down. He introduced me to her, and she looked me dead in the eye. And she says, tell me one thing. Why do people claim to do things in the name of Jesus and can't? I'm like, well, elaborate a little bit. Help me here. She says, I have a crooked back. It's been crooked since I was born. She had saw this TV evangelist on television named W.D. Grant, and he was healing people, and they were getting up and walking and running down the aisles, and she said, I want to go there, and she convinced her parents, who weren't Christian, and this little girl was, to take her down there. She got not only down there, she got up front. They laid her up there. They placed hands on her. He prayed over her and said, you're healed. Get up and go. Go have x-rays. Your, your back is fine. She did what she was told. Her back was as crooked as it ever was. Keep that in your mind. That was my first encounter of someone in that situation, in desperate need of Jesus. We'll share about her faith a little bit later. But I want you to look at this man for a moment. This man's dire need drove him to Jesus. The first thing we need to understand, he had a glimpse of faith. He had a glimpse of faith. Maybe your faith is just flickering. Maybe you're new, but if you have a glimpse of faith, that's a good thing because you need that. But what you need to allow God to do is let that faith grow. You see, this man begs Jesus to come and heal his son. In fact, this man really didn't understand a lot about Jesus because he understood that maybe Jesus was going to have to come to my house and place his hands on my son in order for him to be healed. That's what he thought. He's trying to convince Jesus to come to my house. We see this glimmer of faith. Notice, notice this. He, he doesn't quite understand yet. You're talking to the creator of the universe who spoke the stars into existence, who spoke the, the creatures into existence, who spoke this whole thing into existence by the power of his words. You know, life happens, and there are things that happen that we cannot control most of the time. Life throws us curveballs. Any baseball fans in here? I've become a reinvigorated baseball fan because of those two right there. Whew. We had an emotional game yesterday like I've never seen it for eight-year-old kids in my life. First inning, we up four to, nine, four to two. Then they get, the lead, or they get two more runs and make it uh, four to four, and we go up six to four, and they went up seven to six, and then we went up nine to seven, and they tied it up nine to nine, and then we went up 11 to nine, and then they tied it up 11 to 11, and then we went up 13 to 11, and they scored three runs in the bottom inning, and we lost. We were crushed, but it was such a great game, but it was ups and downs and turns and cycles and great plays and missed chances and opportunities, and that's what life brings to us. So what do we do? We have to find something to put our faith and hope into that is always going to be there. Miracle Blade 2 did not survive. 
Because they didn't expect me to keep the thing 30 or 40 years. They don't know me very well when I buy a product that's going to last forever. I've always said, this has a lifetime guarantee. But my question always is to everybody who says that to me, whose lifetime? Because if it's Abe Lincoln's, it's expired. But if it's Jesus's, it's forever. His faith at this point is not a faith that has led him to salvation. Life had thrown him some curves, but he had an immature faith, not realizing that he was talking to the creator of the universe. So let's notice the second thing. Jesus with every intention to, has every intention of helping this man, but he's going to challenge his faith. The man wants Jesus to go to his house. Jesus doesn't do that. Why? Because here's the goal, folks. Here's the thing you need to write down on your paper and understand. The goal of Jesus is to teach us that a miracle is not always the cause of our faith, but the reward of it. Hear that again. Jesus is trying to teach us that the miracle is not always the cause of our faith, but the reward of our faith. I've talked to many people who have said, well, you didn't have enough faith. No, God doesn't always bless you because of your faith. Or bless you so you can have faith. He blesses you because he's rewarding your faith. Because you're trusting him in situations like this. When he's not here and he can't be touched. And he can't touch the disease. And he can't touch the person. But guess what? He doesn't need to. Notice what he says. Go. Go. Your son will live. That's all he says. That's all he says. He didn't say his fever was going to go away. He didn't say, he just said, your son will live. Now we see a growth in this man. How do you know that? It says the man took Jesus at his word and left. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Because I pondered this last night. If your son was sick and dying and you knew it. And you encountered Jesus. And he spoke to you and said, your son will hear. And you're, you're away from him. You're not there. How long would it take you to get home? Would you go straight home? How many would go straight home? Right then. Drop everything and go. That's me. I'm on my way. I read this and I was like marveled. Listen to this. Listen to it again. He took the man at his word and departed. Didn't say where he went, just said he departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. Now here's the interesting part. When he inquired at the time when his son got better, they said to him, yesterday at 1 o'clock. What's so significant about that? He lived in Galilee, guys. He didn't go straight home. It was the next day. And he's still not home. He's still not home. It was the next day. He's not home. His servants came and met him and said, hey, what does that say about the man's faith? Jesus said he was living fine. I got some stuff I got to do on the way to the house. I got to stop at Walmart. I got to pick this up. I got to get some gas, you know. Whatever it was, I got to feed the mule. I don't know, but he didn't, it didn't look like he run straight home. You know why? His faith grew. He understood something that many of us don't understand. Belief in Jesus as a healer is meant to bring us and lead us to him as a savior. This man did not go immediately home, it doesn't appear. Now, maybe it was a long way, but it was the next day. I believe I'd have been crawling until I got there. I wouldn't have stopped, but he seemed to be, no. And although this man had a weak faith in the beginning, his faith is becoming real. Faith in the wrong things, no matter how strong they are, never, ever relieves. Understand that. Faith, no matter how strong... If it's in the wrong thing, it never relieves. Only faith in Jesus. 
faith in the right thing, even when it's weak, can grow into something spectacular. Because notice what happens now. The third thing we need to understand, faith in action. His faith is real. This man took Jesus at his word in verse 50, and look what happens in verse 53. Then the father realized that it was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live, so he and his whole household believed. His faith led him to his family to share everything that went on. And now he knew who he had encountered to the point they all believed. And they had not necessarily met Jesus. Jesus was moving this man in his faith. Jesus was challenging this man to put his faith into action. To put it into action. What did James say? You show me your faith by what you say. Let me show you my faith by what I do. It takes both. But this man acted on his faith. He truly believed that Jesus had healed his son so much it doesn't look like he made a beeline straight home. And then he wasn't shocked to find out that his son was alive because Jesus had told him that. And then he went to his family because he wanted to know exactly what time did he, what time was it? One in the afternoon, and he knew that's exactly when he said it was. (laughs) Just like he said. So let me ask this question of you and to myself. As Donovan preached, I think it was maybe last week, why do we have so many doubts? Why do we have so many doubts? Why do we struggle with our faith in Jesus? Jesus told this man what was going to happen. It happened. Jesus has told us what's going to happen. It's going to happen. And it doesn't matter all the details or whether we can figure it all out. At the end, Jesus wins. I've always been amazed by the struggles in studying and I've researched about Satan and and how Satan works, and and all the things that he does. And one of those things is that I am becoming convinced of that Satan works so hard because Satan is not like Jesus. Please understand that. He doesn't know how it turns out. I don't think he knows. Now, he believes in God and Jesus because he's faced them. But I don't think he's convinced at the end. That's why he works so hard now. He still thinks he can win. Yesterday in that baseball game, I was convinced we could win. And we were not the best team in the league, and they were the best team in the league. That's what was so amazing about the game. But he's convinced he can win, so he works hard. So for us, our faith in God needs to grow to the point that we believe everything that God has said to us. We believe that he is there. We believe that he is the Son of God. We believe that he is who he says he is. Let me ask you a couple of simple questions, and we'll close on this. If I were to ask you what you believe, what would your answers be? Let me throw some bizarre stuff out there. Do you really believe that God parted the waters of the Red Sea and immediately the wind dried it out and the the Israelites crossed on dry ground? Do you believe that? Because if you don't, you don't have faith in God. Your faith is weak. You might have some, but you don't have it all. It's got to grow. Because you know what? It happened. It happened. It happened just that way. There's another parting of of a river that we don't talk about. The parting of, of the Jordan River when Joshua was leading the people into the promised land. You realize the water stopped? God stopped the river and said, okay, y'all can go across now. And it was dry. You ever been to Muddy River? And I want to tell you something. The Jordan is a muddy river. Do you believe that? 
Is that what you believe? Do you believe that? Because I do. Because if you believe the Bible, you believe that. Do you believe Jonah was swallowed? What a bizarre story by a great fish and lived three days in the ocean, in the belly of a great fish. And then got puked up on the beach and went and did what God told him to do. Do you believe that story? I mean, I tell you, if I got puked on the beach, I would go too. Especially if I'd been in the belly of a fish for great, for three days. And you know what? There's an amazing thing about that that we don't know. Did he live the whole time? If he lived in the whole time, wouldn't that be incredible? Would that be incredible? How many think that'd be incredible? He lived those three days. So do I, but you know what? They have discovered a man many, many years ago. I read an article from out of Florida where he got swallowed by a great fish, a whale shark. And survived. When they caught the shark and cut him open, he was alive. So maybe that's not such a great miracle. You know what would be greater? Go read the book of Jonah. Read as he talks about the water and the seaweed engulfing around him and the water rushing in. Maybe he died. And then when God puked him up, he brought him back to life. One of those things that make you go, hmm question you can ask when you get to heaven but do you believe that story because the bible says it's real it's written there and so it's true go read all of those types of stories all of those things is that what you believe because if you don't your faith needs to continue to grow It needs to grow to the point that you believe without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He died. He died a cruel death. He was nailed to a cross. He was tortured. He was punished. He was put in the heart of the earth for three days, and God brought him back to life in bodily form. That's so important to understand. He was in a glorified body that the, all the apostles saw. And for 40 days he walked the earth and appeared to them in many different times and places. And there was a reason for that. He wanted you and I to know that we do not have to fear death. We don't have to fear. We don't have to be afraid. All we need to do is put our hope and trust in everything that he says. I was talking to a friend last night. He said, you know, I get bombarded by people at work about moral questions and this and that. And I learned something from you that I just say, well, what does the Bible say? What does the book say? And they go, what book? He goes, the book. The book. The Bible. And that's when anytime you have a a struggle with something, what does God say? I don't argue with people anymore about this or about that or about that or about that because we can sit here and pick out verses and argue and fight and have our own theory. And I just go, what does the book say? What does the Bible say? Because it's true. Whatever's written here is true. It's 100% reliable. And this man understood that this came from Jesus. Jesus said, go, your son will live. And it happened. I don't know where you are today in your faith. I don't know if it's flickering, just a, little, just a little flicker. And you need to move to the next stage of trusting what Jesus says. Understand that God will reward your faith. That God will reward your faith. Grow. Let God work in your life. Understand he's not going to make it comfortable. He's going to call you to do things on Friday night, on Sunday morning, because... I think it's because I hadn't preached in a while. And he said, you haven't preached in a while. I don't know why, so let me figure out how to do this. Okay? Let's get Jay stuck. You're going to have to go do it. And that's okay. God's going to ask you, and I've said this for a long time, to go places, the places you don't want to go, to do things that you're uncomfortable with doing because God has a plan for each and every one of us. So let's leave this place growing in our faith, Understanding Jesus said go and trust me and go and do what he calls you to do every day of your life. Let's pray.
God, our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this man that we don't even know his name, who encountered Jesus with a flickering faith and a hope because of a situation in his life. And you just didn't necessarily do something spectacular at that moment. You didn't have fireworks or a big show. You just said, go, your son's alive. He's going to live. The man trusted in you. Help us, Father, to have that kind of faith where when you tell us something that we trust in you and we continue to go and do the things you've called us to do. I pray for the group coming back, and I pray you give them a safe journey so they can be reunited with their families later today. Lord, give them a, a safe trip and a, as they drive back. Thank you for the way you bless us each day. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless everybody. Have a great week. Thank you all so much for worshiping with us this week. If you enjoyed today,